Hey, welcome back everybody. Thanks for clicking on this video. I got a pretty interesting one here for you today. Well, not so much interesting as completely psychotic and very racist uh, from a person who lacks any self-awareness apparently or is unknowingly part of a cult. So we have this New York Times article, which is an opinion piece uh, and a guest essay, whatever that is. I don't know, maybe they added that in later after this came out and they got some blowback. Uh, but it's called, Is My Little Library Contributing to the Gentrification of My Black Neighborhood? Okay, well that's that's kind of a weird, you know, headline. It To me, it come, comes off immediately as racist because, you know, what is gentrification? I mean, really, all that is is a word for people of different races coming into neighborhoods that are predominantly another race. And, and in this case, you know, they're complaining that white people are coming in and just changing the makeup of these neighborhoods, which is... You know, pretty interesting considering it used to be a white majority and slowly that changed and now it's mostly black and Latinos that are living there. So right off the bat, we have this kind of weird contradiction where, you know, you should be all about, you know, different races coming in to live in your neighborhood, right? Doesn't that add to the tapestry and the melting pot? It adds to the diversity because diversity is good, right? Well, not when, you know, you're a person who believes that diversity essentially means that there's less or no white people at all. I mean, we're talking about people who play up this idea of, quote, ending whiteness. So really, in that context, diversity really means there's just no white people there. And that's the way they like it, apparently. She starts off, uh, about a year ago, I decided to build a library on my front lawn. By library, I mean one of those little freestanding library boxes that dot lawns in bedroom communities around the country. Charming, birdhouse-like structures filled with books, that invite neighbors and passers-by to take a book or donate a book or both. I'd spotted the phenomenon on walks through upscale, largely white neighborhoods around Los Angeles and immediately resolved to bring it home to Inglewood. Okay, that's weird. So she's saying that she's incorporating something that she got from a white community. She's gonna incorporate it into hers. Why not? A library is not so much of a marker of wealth and whiteness as it is affirmation of community and cozy small town camaraderie that Inglewood... <laughs> that's funny. A mostly black and Latino city in southwestern Los Angeles County has plenty of. We deserve no less. But then she goes on to describe Inglewood, California as, quote, cozy and that has small town camaraderie. Oh, really? Look, I've never been to California, but I grew up in the 90s. I, I was a huge, you know, gangster rap fan growing up. And I know that Inglewood specifically is quite a violent neighborhood. Just think, you know, Easy e and Dr. Dre. Both guys, a lot of their songs are about this area. They're about South Central and, and uh, Inglewood. So she talks about it being slow at first and that people started to kind of come around and browse and some people took books and traded books, so it was working good. Then one morning, glancing out my front window, I saw a young white couple stopped by the library. Instantly, I was flooded with emotions astonishment and then resentment and then astonishment again at my resentment it all converged into a silent scream in my head of get off my lawn <laughs> oh my god like how com like can you imagine a white person writing this article about you know a mostly white neighborhood where they put out their their little mini library for people to come and trade books and they saw a black couple come up and just look at their books and trade books. Oh, and I was just astonished with resentment and anger that these black people would, who, what are they thinking coming into this neighborhood using my library that I put out there for the public, for everyone, except for, you know, those people. <laughs> it's just, it goes to show how these people are really in a cult. They're not, you, you can't think for a second that these people are actually using any kind of like thought process. It's pure indoctrination by a cult. I mean, just think about it for a second. You're against racism. You know, you don't want people being treated differently for the color of their skin, but then you reach some point where you start saying, huh, well, actually, I do hate these people because of their skin color, but I mean, obviously that makes me a hypocrite. So I have to tell myself that because of power plus, plus privilege, 
I can't be racist. Ha, perfect. Oh, now I can just basically say and do whatever I want. All these things that if a white person was doing that, it'd be clearly bigotry, clearly racism. But when you're part of this woke cult, no, it's completely different. It's completely different when they do it. This is why you see at these multi-heritage spaces at university colleges, when white people show up to these things, you'll have the uh, black students in there actually, and in both cases that I know that's happened, it's been a, a black woman, but they kick these white people out citing that, oh, you know, this is the multi-heritage festival. White people have no heritage. You know, white whiteness doesn't exist. And so you can't be here. I mean, these people are literally part of a cult that want to achieve an end to us existing. And these people, for whatever reason, are being, you know, given positions as professor at university colleges, are being held up as these uh, brilliant thinkers. You talked about the importance of defining racism, but I, but I, unless I missed it, which is possible, I don't. I didn't hear your personal definition. Is there is there one that you would offer us? Like, how do you define racism? Sure. So racism, I would define it um, as a collection uh, of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. <laughs> And then you see things like this, where this woman's uh, opinion piece is just posted like, uh, it's like they don't even realize how insanely racist this comes off. But that's because all of this mantra she's using, it, it, it's all part of this cult movement. And so they can't even, they can't even see themselves. They have literally zero uh, self-awareness of, of how utterly racist they are because at the end of the day, in the back of their heads, they can't be racist. And so back to this point that it's Inglewood that we're talking about, and she's upset that there's white people moving into this neighborhood. Well, let's, first of all, I wanna look at this woman just a little bit here, uh, who she is. Erin Aubrey Kaplan is a Los Angeles journalist and a born in 1962, has written about African-American political, economic, cultural issues since 1992. But it says here that she was married to Alan Kaplan, who uh, passed away in 2015. I'm, I'm curious about that. Let's let's see a little bit about who this guy is. He must be some sort of like, you know, ultra, you know, like Black Panther activist or something like that for her to have these, you know, such you know, very extremist views. Look at that. It's a white guy. Alan Kaplan was a white guy. That's strange. Huh. That's weird that she would have such like anger and resentment about a white person using her library and being in her, in her presence when she was married to a white person. Weird. 14 years ago, I wrote an article for Salon.com, of course, published for Valentine's Day, about how I met my husband, Alan Kaplan, and I ended the article on a cautionary note. Our hugely improbable, racially romantic story did not mean that we'd solved the problems of color line. Far from it. Strip away the circumstances that I was a reporter and he was a reluctant subject of an interview for a story I was writing at the time. And we were merely a black woman and a Jewish man from different parts of LA. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. I wonder if he actually even considers himself white, uh, because I know uh, there's a lot of Jewish folks out there who don't. The one that's really coming to mind is Walter Cronkite. What, which month is White History Month? <laughs> well, 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 come on, tell me. Well, the, I'm Jewish. Okay, which I'm month Jewish. is Jewish History Month? I also want to touch a little bit on the fact that she's upset that white people are, quote, gentrifying her neighborhood, her black and Latino neighborhood, that apparently is being ruined Ruined by white people. White people using her library books. Well, <laughs> let's, let's just take a look at this neighborhood. So, again, I'm no, you know, I'm not an expert on Inglewood, but I do have a list here of the five most dangerous places in Inglewood. So we got Lock Haven, we got Morningside Park, we got Holly Park Knowles, we got Hyde Park, we got Westchester. I mean, these are all places that are right in this area. If I scan around this box, you're going to see all of those places listed here. And like I said, this is a small area. And the point is, it seems to me that, uh, you know, white people being in this neighborhood are the least of their problems. Gang violence is out of control in this area. And it, it, it has been that way for decades. The moment jolted me into realizing some things I'm not especially proud of. I had set out this library for all who have lived here and even those who didn't, in theory, I would not want to restrict anyone from looking at it or taking books based on race or anything else, but that's what she's doing. I mean, that, that's what she wants to do. I don't, I don't think she actually did that, but that's what she wants to do. She is enraged by white people taking books. But while I had seen white newcomers to the neighborhood here and there, the truth was I hadn't set it out to appeal to white residents. And just think about the fact that she's totally cool with this. Like, I can't imagine thinking like that, like being angry that somebody is 
being neighborly and is in my neighborhood because of their skin color. But this is the situation we're in now in this country where these people, people like this, even other white people who have been uh, indoctrinated to believe these things. This is why you have BLM and Antifa showing up to residential neighborhoods and literally telling white people that they need to give up their homes or that even though they have a BLM sign, that that won't protect them from violence and that if the BLM wants to take their home, they're just gonna take their home and that's justified. And then the media wonders why we call them enemy of the people. I mean, they are literally inciting, promoting, and defending open racism against whites in this piece. What I resented was not this specific couple. Oh, okay, all right. It was their whiteness. Oh, well that makes it totally different. And my feelings of helplessness at not knowing how to maintain the integrity of a black space that I had created. The integrity, because when white people come in, that just ruins it. I mean, you're bringing the, these dirty people that aren't even people of color. I mean, are they even people? I mean, they lack color, they're white. The most complicated feeling of it all was the brief bittersweet satisfaction I took in watching them draw to my lawn and to my idea. It felt empowering and hopeful on one hand, defeating on the other. I just... <laughs> So what message do I hope they took from my library? The same message I wanted to send to the rest of my neighbors, my community. Black presence has a value in every sense of the word and on its own terms. That value should make the casual displacement of black people untenable. I mean, what is she even talking about at this point? Why people existing on the sidewalk at that moment somehow has displaced? black people or uh, I thought that racially segregated areas were bad I thought diversity was good but again I'm retreading old ground here but the fact is these people see diversity as no white people that value should make the casual displacement of black people untenable even immoral and that will take much more than a little library to rectify let me tell you something the problems in Inglewood are not white people Okay, it's gang violence that has gripped that city and a lot of California for decades now, going back to when I was a kid growing up in the 90s. This tale of racism seems very old to me. I mean, this is just classic old racism. Taking your problems, all your problems, and pointing to uh, the minority group, which in this case is white people, and pointing out them as the problem, them being in your neighborhood is the problem when we're talking about a neighborhood that is literally one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in this country and i hate to tell you this but it's not white people who are to blame for all this murder and violence all right folks i think that's about all i have for that one as always thank you for clicking on this video if you enjoyed it please hit that like button subscribe and let me know what you think in the comments